Hey friends, welcome into Cross My Heart Ministry. I'm Laura McFarlane. We have landed in Nehemiah chapter eight this week in our study. Last week, last time we saw the completion of the walls and the, the gates had been repaired and everything is set there to do the rebuilding and the people are safe physically. And so now with the walls rebuilt, now it's time to pivot and rebuild the lives of the people spiritually. And that's what Nehemiah eight is all about. And that's kind of where we're going with the rest of the book of Nehemiah. We see the people standing, coming together as one and wanting to hear from the word of God. They're getting back to the basics. And we talked about that in the teaching lecture about going back to the basics and how as we hear the word of God, it will it will bring change. We have to revere it and respond to it. I hope you'll listen to the teaching lecture in its entirety. And I hope you will prayerfully consider how God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, is calling you to respond to his holy word. For Cross My Heart Ministry, I'm Laura McFarlane. You may have recognized legendary coach Vince Lombardi when you saw his picture up on the screen. Kind of date yourself a little bit if you do. But if you recognize coach Lombardi, you probably know that he was the famous coach of the Green Bay Packers in the 1960s. Now I know many of you were not even alive then, but he, was, he led his team to win the very first two Super Bowl championships ever. He was quite the coach. He's now considered a football legend. He is um, just a, a famous coach, and his leadership style has not only earned him a lot of respect in the world of sports, but also in the world of business. There have been books written about him. His leadership style is modeled and emulated. People talk about him. He's quoted, just revered and followed by leadership people as, as well as sports people. So perhaps at some point, you've even heard the famous quote that's here on the screen. Gentlemen, this is a football. Maybe you've heard it, but you don't know the context behind it. I want to share a little bit about that with you. In December of 1960, he and his team lost the NFL championship to the Philadelphia Eagles in the final few minutes of the game. And it was a crushing and very disappointing loss for the coach and for his team. And Coach Lombardi decided right then and there that he was going to figure out how to keep that from happening again. And so from December of 1960 until the following July when he started training camp for the 1961 fall season, he had six months to think and plan on what he was going to do different. And so that following July, on the opening day of training camp, that coach marched into to those men, his players, with determination to get back to the basics. And as he did that, he held up a pigskin and he sort of growled, gentlemen, this is a football. And I, I just sort of imagine him sort of barking that out there to those men. And so getting back to the basics is what, gentlemen, this is a football is all about. So these were professional football players. These were grown men. But he talked to the men about blocking and tackling. And he talked to them uh, about offense and defense. He said, this is the end zone. This is the line of scrimmage. He went all the way back. He didn't, he didn't jump to focus on trick plays or sophisticated methods to win the next championship. He led them back to the basics to focus on the fundamentals. They may have been professional men, but he spoke to them like they were Pee Wee League third graders. He went back to the basics. That's the essence of this is a football. There are powerful lessons in that statement about not only playing football, but about being successful in business as well. It's why he's so revered and modeled and emulated and quoted and talked about. But there are also powerful lessons for living the Christian life. Sometimes we need to get back to the basics. And I think that's what God's people were doing in Nehemiah chapter 8. Would you stand with me in honor of God's holy word as I read the first 12 verses of God's word as recorded in the book of Nehemiah. 
Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they had made for the purpose and beside him at his right hand stood Mattahiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hikiah, Masiah, and at his left hand Padiah, Mishal, Malchijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Achab, Shabbatai, Hadojai, Masalah, Kilata, Azariah, Jozebed, Hanan, Pelei, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions and rejoice greatly, because they understood the words that were declared to them. Ladies, thank you for standing in honor of God's word. You may be seated. And would you just pray with me as we begin? God Almighty, thank you for your word. We pray today that it would not return void. God, we hold up our hands, our hearts, our minds, just asking you to give us renewed understanding. We ask that you would enlighten our hearts and minds. Let us connect with what the people were experiencing then as they honored and revered your word. And let us as women of God do the same. Teach us from your word. Holy Spirit, guide us, direct us, fill us, equip us. And God, I ask for a takeaway truth for each woman here, that we would not only be hearers of the word, but we would be doers. That like Ezra, we would want to know what it says. God, we would want to do what it says. And then we pray that our lives, by our very example and the choices we make, would teach others to, to know your word and to be drawn to you. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the gift of your word. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, I pray all this and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Well, ladies, as Nehemiah opens, as Nehemiah chapter 8 opens, we're seeing now a shift in direction that we're pivoting now from here for the rest of the book. The first seven chapters that we've just completed were all devoted to rebuilding the walls and repairing the gates, the walls of the city, but that work is now completed. The broken walls have been repaired, and now the focus is on rebuilding the broken lives of the people spiritually. And that means going back to the basics, back to the Word of God. Let's take a moment to remember just how they got to this point. When we began our study of Nehemiah, we went all the way back to Genesis, if you remember in the intro lesson. The first man and the first woman had a sweet relationship with God. They walked with God. They talked with God. They were in that garden where everything was perfect. They had that relationship with him, but then they sinned, and it broke that relationship, and that began the history of God's people rejecting him, adopting the ways of the world, suffering for it, and then finally returning to him. And over and over again, our great God repeatedly called them to repent, and then fellowship with him would be restored when they did. 
It's a cycle that was repeated from Genesis all the way up to now. Our intro class, you remember, traced that cycle back and brought it all the way up to the time of the Babylonian ca exile and captivity and the events that we are studying in the book of Nehemiah. During that time, God used prophets to call the people back in the years preceding the Babylonian exile and even while they were there. God sent the prophet Jeremiah to speak to his people. Jeremiah devoted 40 years of his life to be God's mouthpiece. He spoke to the people before the exile, trying to warn them what would happen if they didn't repent. And even after they were in exile, a letters, letters were sent. So he, he was, for his trouble, he was ignored, he was mocked, he was ridiculed, he was even imprisoned. At one point, God asked Jeremiah to write down all the prophecies that he had given to him. And so Nehemiah did that. And, and he, and he uh, obeyed God and uh, delivered that, that, those prophecies as God instructed him to, to the king of Judah. And the king of Judah cut them up into little pieces and burned them in the fire. Of course, God just had him make another scroll, so we, we have it recorded today. But burning the message did not keep the prophecies from coming true. The king just thought, well, I don't want to hear that. That's not good news. That's not anything I want to know any more than ignoring God's word today will end well for us. In 586 BC, the Babylonians destroyed the temple, tore down the walls, and carted most of the people off into captivity. They abandoned God, but God did not abandon them. Jeremiah's ministry continued even after they were in Babylon. His prophecy, God's word for them, was sent via letter. This was the message that God had for them that was recorded in Jeremiah 29, 10 to 11. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. That verse may be familiar to you. It's what I call one of the coffee cup verses in the Bible. I, I have plans for you, for good, says the Lord. But now we know the context of it. It's extraordinary. These words of God were written to the people while they were in captivity. He wrote to reassure them that this wasn't going to last forever. They weren't going to be in, in, in exile in Babylon forever. And he even gave them a timetable. He said, 70 years your exile has an expiration date. You're going to be there for 70 years, and then God's going to bring them back. Even in their sin, even in their idol worship, all the despicable practices they had adopted from the people that whom they lived around and, and how they had so mistreated and mocked and, and mistreated his prophet, he, they, he, he, God still loved them, even in their sin. And even though they had abandoned him, he never abandoned them. They turned their back on him. He never turned his back on them. And ladies, we need to hear that. We serve the same God today. He is unchanging. The same God that loved them and didn't abandon them is the same God that never gives up on us. God is ever faithful, even when we are not. Look at his plans for them. Look at the things that he says in the last couple of lines of, these, of this passage. He's going to give him peace, a future, and a hope. But well, that sounds pretty good. And it sounds even better when you are captives in a foreign land. Peace, a future, and a hope. Those are things to hold on to, like a drowning man grabbing hold of a life preserver. These words come to them not while they're living their best life, not while they're following God or worshiping God and obeying God or living for God but while they're in captivity as the direct result, they came as the direct result of ignoring God and stiff arming God and doing their own thing. It came while they were living in a foreign land. And all those circumstances, peace and hope and a future are suddenly going to sound very desirable. They've lost so much, lost family, lost friends, lost, lost safety, security, lost their land. And so suddenly when everything else is hopeless, the, the message of peace and a future and a hope sounds very desirable. They're finally in a place that they will listen to what God has for them. They wouldn't hear it 
when they were living as they pleased and doing their own thing. But now that life has become hard, perhaps now finally this is a message that will resonate. Ladies, difficult as it is to hear, you and I know it's true. God uses hard things in our lives to get our attention and to get the attention of those that we love and pray for. I think that's part of the reason that when we pray for someone we love or for ourselves, we need to pray according to thy will, if it be thy will. Because you see, we want to just find that stop button and hit it. Just, just stop God. What do I have to say? How long do I have to pray? What do I have to do to make it stop and make it go away? God, make the cancer stop. God, open the door to a new job. God, let, let him defy the odds and walk again. Um, you know, fill in the blank. Think about the prayers that we prayed for those that we love. God will give you the glory for it. Do this. Fix her. Change him. Do it right now, God. But what if? What if those tragic circumstances are, are the very, that the we really want to pray away, are, are the very thing that God might be using to answer our bigger prayer? Our, that is, and that is his best plan for that person that we love. The thing that we're railing against and praying against that, that, that brings such despair to us might be part of God's grand plan to redeem the life of that person we love so much. What if the hard thing is the very thing that God may be using to bring your child or my child or your spouse or my spouse or, or an aunt or an uncle or a mother or a friend or, or your high school best friend or your neighbor, fill in the blank. Who have you prayed for? to either come to know Jesus or to wake up and come back to Jesus. And God and his eternal sovereign love could be working a bigger plan than what we could ever ask or imagine. And frankly, wouldn't even want. Who are you praying for? Who in your life needs to come to God or have their faith long dormant reignited that either needs to come to God or come back to God? As we pray, we do need to pray specific, but let's also pray with an open heart and an open mind, a, a, a desire to imagine what God might be doing that is different from the way that we would do it. God, are you doing something in this circumstance? Do you have a plan that I don't see? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 tells us, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is God speaking. For my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Are we grateful? Are we grateful that we serve a God who's way smarter than we are? Are we grateful that we serve a God that knows way more than we know? Are we grateful for a God that sees eternally? For we have this sort of spiritual myopia that we just see what's right in front of us. He's always working and he plays the long game. He, he's, he's playing that long game. We might just want to take little inches as we move the ball down the field of life, but God is playing the big, long, eternal game. God used the prophet Jeremiah to reassure the people that they do have a future and they do have a hope. And then the next two verses in Jeremiah 29 say this, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. All your heart. Nothing held back. All in. When you hit rock bottom, when they have nothing, then they'll finally be ready to listen to God. They've lost the land. They've lost their freedom. They've lost their way. They've lost family and friends. And finally, all they can do is look up and look to God. When they get to the place that they're ready to call upon him and pray to him, then our gracious, loving God is always eager and ready to listen. Even after all they've done to, to reject him, he is ready to hear when they call and to provide for them. And he's the same God today, friends. He is the same unchanging, faithful, sovereign, loving, compassionate, merciful God today to us that he was to them. Like the Israelites, when we call out to him, when we seek him, we can find him. 
He wants to be known. He wants us to find him. He wants us to know him. He wants us to call on him. He wants us to bow to him. But he is God and he wants all of us. He wants us to be all in, all your heart. We, do, we don't just fit him in where it's convenient, when it's comfortable, when we can work him in. We don't just fit him in among all of our other affections. He's going to be the before anything else. My daughter taught me that phrase when she was in high school. He wants to be your bae, your before anything else. He must have first place. He will not settle for anything less. And he deserves our all. Is he first place? Is he on the throne of your life? Is he your before anything else? Are you all in with your whole heart, your, your, all, all your heart? He wants it all. Are you all in? That's what Nehemiah 8 is all about. The Israelites choosing to be all in, to seek God with all their hearts. That's the basic. Back to the basics. The walls are secure as we open this chapter. That the gates are in place. But physical safety is not enough. It's not enough. Trusting in God brings the ultimate security. It brings eternal security. Chapter 8 opens this way. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. A lot of things to observe here. Number one, worship seems to be prompted by the people. Do you see that? The people seem to initiate this. It doesn't say that Nehemiah or, or Ezra stepped up and said, well, everybody gather around now. We're going to read the word of God. The people assembled as one. The text tells us that they came together. Their hearts were united. They asked for the word of God to be read from them. They wanted to hear from God. This is congregation initiated worship. And then number two, Ezra makes his first appearance. This is the first time we see Ezra showing up in the book of Nehemiah. You're going to remember when we started, we talked about there had been three waves of people, exiles returning from Jerusalem. Zerubbabel brought the first, Ezra brought the second wave of people, and then Nehemiah brought the third group. So Ezra is a contemporary of Nehemiah, but scholars tell us he was probably a few years older than Nehemiah. While Nehemiah served as the governor and, and sort of the political leader of the people, Ezra was the priest and the scribe to the people. It also tells us that they assemble at the water gate. Now, um, I just want to do a little time out here and issue a, a little bitty caution about looking for signs and symbols in everything. And I know that when we studied all those gates, it was fun to kind of look at the, the symbolism of all that. But I, I am, I'm a woman that likes to take the text literally and not to try to stretch it to mean more than it should. The details about the water gate might just be here for historical context. They met at the water gate, just a historical fact. We never want to add more that was intended. There's always a caution about allegorizing or spiritualizing the text in a way that, that was not intended to be. Some people are, are fixated on finding symbols and signs and, and looking for secrets like, like you're solving a puzzle or, or working your way through a video game to find the secret place to unlock something. I, I think it's possible that they assembled at the water gate because that was the area that was large enough to accommodate everybody or because they were going to be gathered there together for several hours. The Gion Spring, which was the water source, was right outside the gate. So maybe they gathered there because there was water supply. And if you're going to be there for several hours, somebody might need a drink. So it, it could be just that simple. It reminds me of the story that I heard once about the, the woman who always cut her ham in half when she baked it and, put it and baked it in two pans. And her daughter said, Mom, why do you do that? And she said, well, that's what your grandma always did. So, uh, I, 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 so she called her mom and said, Mom, why did you always um, bake, cut the ham in half and bake in two pans? Well, that's what my mother did. So she said, I'll ask your grandmother. So she called her mom and said, Mom, why did you do that? I just remember watching you and learning from you to cut the ham in half and bake it in two pans. Why did you do that? She goes, my pan wasn't big enough. I didn't have a pan big enough to bake the ham in one. You know, sometimes the practical answer is the answer. They met at the water gate. And so maybe that's all we need to know without looking for anything beyond that. The bigger thing is that they asked for the word of God. 
They were thirsty for it, Watergate. They were hungry and thirsty for it. They wanted the book of the law of the Moses. So most likely, that was the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. But then verse 2 says this. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. So pay attention to that. We're getting a date here. There's a detail that's going to become important. The time frame of the seventh month. Now on the Jewish calendar, that would be New Year's Day, the first day of, of their year. And what better day than New Year's Day to make a, a new commitment or to renew an old commitment? With this physical safety secure, now they're ready to focus on their spiritual lives. And like we make New Year's resolutions, New Year's Day is a great day to make this resolve to do this. Verse 2 also records that Ezra brought the law before them and read it to the men and the women. In this patriarchal society, I think that's an important point for us to embrace and celebrate that the women were included. But then it also says all who could understand. And I read several different scholars and commentaries that talked about well, what does that mean, all who could understand? Well, some different ideas were offered. One, it could mean the children that were old enough to understand were also included in the, in the assembly. It could also understand that there were those with physical limitations that they couldn't hear. And so maybe, maybe they weren't there. And if, or, or it could be that there were those that had a language barrier. If, if you and I could be taken back in time to medieval to the medieval period, we would find it challenging to understand Old English. It would sound very different. And one commentator that I studied said that conversational Hebrew in Nehemiah's time would be very different from the Hebrew that Ezra was reading from. So maybe that was part of the challenge of understanding. But regardless, let's note the engagement of those who did understand and were gathered for the reading. In, in verse three, that he read, from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Note the commitment and the engagement of the people who were listening. Ezra, and, and, and note that Ezra read from daybreak until noon. That's five to six hours of listening while they were also standing, as we'll see in verse five. And they weren't just there in body. Their minds were engaged. It says that they listened attentively. My, my retired teachers in the group just love those adverbs. I'm sure you do because I love them so much. They didn't just listen. They lit, listened attentively. They were, they were inclined. My grandma liked to use that word. I'm just inclined to do this or inclined to do this. They, 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 were, they were leaning in. They were listening attentively. They were focused. Last week, uh, a lot of you know that I traveled back to West Virginia for my high school class reunion. And then after that, Kevin and I took a West Virginia vacation and visited a lot of the places that, that my family never had the, the money to go to when I was a kid. Lots of state parks, did lots of hiking, got to see a lot of places that I had studied when I took West Virginia history in eighth grade. But we also went back to my college alma mater. I graduated from West Virginia Wesleyan college and here's a picture of me on the campus of that beautiful university i went there it was the first college i ever set foot on the campus now i was born a coal miner's daughter in west virginia and my daddy started talking to me about getting a college education from as early as i could remember so it was a given that my even though my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents had never gone to college i was going to go and so when i got to go to cheerleading camp in eighth grade that summer at, on this campus, that was the first college I ever stepped foot on. And I just, I just thought it was beautiful. I just fell in love and that's where I wanted to go. And, um, but it, the private tuition was twice as much as going to West Virginia University. And I wasn't sure it was gonna work out. And my mom was kind of scared about me going to the big university and all the party stuff she heard about there. But we prayed about it and um, I got a call from Wesley and they doubled my honor scholarship and made it the same price as going to the state school. So I don't know if it was my desire or my mama's desire, but I ended up getting to go to West Virginia Wesleyan College. But um, I, I, when I was at Wesleyan, um, that's the chapel behind me. It's called the Wesley Chapel. And I want to tell you, I was a good girl. I got dressed up every Sunday morning and I put myself in that pew 
and I went to church every Sunday morning because that's what good girls do. You see, my, my parents, um, my mom, I, I think was a believer, but she didn't, didn't really make a profession until I was actually out of college. And my dad became a believer after I was already a mom. So they dropped me off at church when I was a little girl. Um, and I accepted Christ as, as a kid, but my, that was my salvation story. Started to follow Jesus wholeheartedly when I was in my 20s. I sort of feel like I almost have two testimonies. So I was still in sort of the good girl mode at this point. So, um, and I wanted to have that outward appearance of being a good girl. So I, I was a rule keeper. So they had services right there on campus every week. And so here's the thing. I was there physically. I was in that pew and I was there at my mind. It was miles away. I would sit there with my eyes open and my eyes on that pastor preaching, but I would be planning in my mind, okay, I got to do this homework. I'm going to do this. I would write a paper in my head. I just mapped out my week because, you know, I was determined to graduate with all A's because I'm that good girl going to dot every I and cross every T. It was an outward form of obedience with no heart engagement hard for me to confess that. I mean, I'm really kind of ashamed about that. My, my body was in the pew in that building pictured there behind me on the screen, but my mind was elsewhere, planning my to-do list, mapping out my afternoon, just, just a tragic waste of time. What could I have learned? What did I miss out on? And I, and I look back with no small degree of regret about lost opportunities and time wasted, and I wonder, do you have regrets like me? Do you have anything that makes you look back with a sense of loss or shame? But ladies, I want to tell you, I've come to believe that regret is not really a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. The, the advantage of going back to your high school class reunion or your college alma mater is it's a reminder of who you used to be and who you no longer are. You can celebrate what God has done in your life. I've come to believe that God can use going back and revisiting who you were then to make you celebrate how far he's taken you and that you are a different person by his grace and by his provision. We can celebrate all of us. We're not who we used to be. And then we can pivot and look forward with expectation and say, and I'm not yet who I'm going to be either. I want to look back on this chick in five years and say, praise God, I'm not who I used to be then in 2024. The woman who says she has no regrets is to be pitied. She's to be pitied. But the, the, does that mean that she's still that same young and dumb girl that she was at 15 or 16? My friend Brenda talked about that. We had a, a prayer breakfast for the, the class of 79 women the morning of the class reunion. And there were a few of gals gathered, and it was just a joy to share some prayer requests and to visit who we are now. And I, I love Brenda's using that phrase about being young and dumb in high school. And I hope every woman in this room has a young and dumb testimony. A testimony that says, this is who I was, but God, but God, and this is who I am now. If you're a follower of Jesus, you probably have a young and dumb, but God story, and I hope you do. Life abiding with Christ should bring some change. We should all look back and celebrate that we're not what we used to be. But life should also be one of continual transformation. We should be different women today than we were 10 years ago or 10 months ago or even last week. And then we look ahead with the expectation of being different still in the years to come. And we say hallelujah and praise God. You and I may have wasted years neglecting the word of God, but where are we now? Because when conviction comes, it's what you do next that counts. The people revered and respected the word of God. Look at what verse five says. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Did you see that? Ezra opened the book. He opened the word of God. And when he did, everybody stood up. They stood in honor of God's word. And so ladies, this is where the tradition that we have in Bible study comes from. We get it from Ezra and, and the, the book of Nehemiah. It's a visual reminder to all of us to respect the word of God. It's a reminder that it's not your teacher you honor, it's the word of God. And it's a reminder to your teacher that's, that God's word is to be handled very soberly and very seriously, and that she must prepare carefully and prayerfully and conscientiously and only 
with the power of the Holy Spirit is that possible. Ladies, the woman of God reveres the word of God. She reveres the word of God. What is your attitude towards God's word? How has it changed through the years? Are you like I was back then, giving an outward appearance of being a good church girl, physically there but mentally checked out? Do you, do you, do you fit it in when it's convenient? Or are you all in, wholehearted, hungering and thirsting for it? If you're not where you should be, and, or, and, and you just don't feel like you've got that want to, then pray that God would, would help you be there. God, give me the want to. Give me that desire for a deeper reverence, a deeper longing for your word, and make that your prayer. Consider praying back to God the words of Psalm 86, 11. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. God, give us all undivided hearts hearts that are all in and committed to you. When we truly hear the word of God, it will elicit a response. Look at how the people responded to the word in verse six. They answered, amen, amen. And while lifting up their hands, and it says they bowed their heads and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Ezra praised the Lord, the people lifted their hands, the word prompted worship. The people responded to the word by declaring, amen, amen. Amen means so be it. They are agreeing with the word of God. And I want you to note that it's repeated twice and with an exclamation point. So that seems to come with a lot of intense emotion right here. They repeated it twice, exclamation point, they're all in. So remember the prophecy of Jeremiah that we started with? All your heart. It looks like they're all in with all their hearts. And then look at what they did next. They bowed down and worshiped. The phrase is found often in both the Old and the New Testament, bowed down and worship. And note the order. We talked about this when we did our Christmas study last year. And we looked at the wise men when they came, these rich, wealthy, well-to-do Gentile kings that traveled long and far to worship baby Jesus and they brought their gifts these Gentile kings to worship a Hebrew baby. And it says they bowed down and worshiped. Note the order. First you bow down and then you worship. And I think the suggestion is that only a truly humble heart can adequately and fully worship God. And so we mourn and we confess our sin. That's the bowing down. And then we're ready to rise up and worship God with grateful praise. It's a picture of the gospel. Really, first we repent and acknowledge our sin, and then we're ready to get up and worship God with a clean heart, a heart that he has made clean. First John 1, 9 tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. We come to him in repentance the first time for salvation, to enter into a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. But for the child of God, that's growing and changing and alive and who is all in, life is one of continual repentance as long as we're on this planet. It becomes this continual cycle. It's part of our growing, our sanctification. Salvation, we come into a relationship with Jesus through repentance, but our sanctification, which is just a big churched up word for growing up in Christ, but we, we continually repent. And, and when the Holy Spirit convicts, we just say, yes, sir, and agree with him and confess it and then move on. Don't get hung up. Stay in there. Confess it and then worship and, and celebrate that you've been forgiven. Life in Christ includes bowing down and worshiping. They did it then and we did it then when we accepted him. But then we continue to do that. The reading of the word brings a response from the people of God. The woman of God reveres the word. And the woman of God responds to the word of God. The church meeting in Nehemiah 8 included reading and revering the word of God. And then we see the people responding to it. They didn't just want to know what the word said. It changed them. They responded. Verse 9 tells us the response of the people included mourning and weeping. Conviction of sin should cause us to mourn and weep. But we don't stay in that place. We receive God's forgiveness and we move on to joy and worship. When you get stuck there, you're focusing on yourself. And the focus always needs to be on Jesus. 
celebrating the forgiveness that you have received. Verse 10 tells us that, that they, he, he said to them, go on your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to the Lord. Don't sorrow. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah, Ezra, and the Levites encouraged the people to move on from their mourning, to celebrate with food and praise. Don't just, and, and, and don't you just love that phrase, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Boy, we could do a whole lesson just on that. Our, our sin leaves us defenseless and weak and broken, condemned and without hope when we really see ourselves for who we really are. It, it can bring no small degree of shame and guilt. And, and that's the place we have to come to to acknowledge that we need him. We call out and he answers. We acknowledge that we're defenseless and he becomes our defender. We acknowledge that we're condemned and he sets us free. We acknowledge that we have no hope in ourselves and then he gives us a hope in the future. The joy of the Lord becomes our strength in the person of Jesus Christ, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him, all the horror, all the pain and shame that was brought on our Lord Jesus as the sins of the world were heaped upon him, your sin and my sin, he suffered the grief and the pain that we deserve, it should have been ours. He hung on that cross and he suffered the most horrible death that one human being has ever come up with to put another to death. It was specifically designed to not only bring on death, but to stretch it out as long as possible and make it as painful as possible. He hung there and he suffered for the likes of you and me. But for the joy set before him, do you read that and you're just almost confounded by it? It almost sounds illogical. The joy, the joy of it, it was joy for Jesus to redeem the likes of you and me. Does that even make any sense? The gospel we talked about in one of the groups I was in, the gospel almost sounds I irrational, illogical, too good to be true. And it is that the perfect Holy Son of God would condescend to endure the cross but he did it because he loves us. He conquered sin and death and he's alive today. And ladies, he's coming back. Do you believe that? Not just with your head, but in your heart. Do you believe that? And are you living like you believe that? How is God calling you to respond to the word of God, to respond to Jesus, the living word? John 1.1 1, 1 tells us in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is the living word. We respond to the written word. We can't separate from knowing the written word from knowing Jesus, the living word. We revere and respond to the word. Sometimes we don't learn anything new. We just need to remember what we already know and believe and choose to lean into that. We look back, we remember and remind each other to celebrate and to renew. It's what the Israelites did in verses 13 to 18 in Nehemiah 8. As God's word was read to them, they remembered the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. This feast to remember God's provision for them in the wilderness as they had left Egypt. Their time in the wilderness was the journey that, for their ancestors, the journey from bondage to freedom. And, and as they also awaited the time to enter into the promised land. Amazingly, in God's sovereignty, it, you just can't orchestrate this. The completion of the walls and the worship service in Nehemiah 8 coincided with the annual timing for the Feast of Tabernacles. Isn't that extraordinary? That's no coincidence. That's a God thing. The people responded by reinstituting the Feast of Tabernacles. It had not been fully celebrated since the days of Joshua. It was a time to remember and a time to renew. As followers of Jesus living this side of the cross, it's also good for us to remember and to renew. As they look back and remembered bondage and slavery in Egypt and celebrated their freedom, you and I look back and remember our bondage and slavery to sin and the fact that Jesus has set us free. I think when we take communion with our brothers and sisters in Christ, 
that's a time for us to remember and to renew as New Testament believers. But it's also our, our, our daily time in the word and, and, and in prayer as we daily abide in him. We remember and we renew for the Israelites in the wilderness all those years even before what's happening in Nehemiah. It was a time to renew hope, to remember that while they lived in freedom as they had come out of Egypt, they also were not yet in the promised land. They were kind of in this middle place, out of bondage and slavery, but not yet where they were headed, that time in the wilderness. And in a sense, we too live in the now, but not yet, as we await the glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our identity in Christ is a sure thing, our confident hope. We live in the now, but not yet. The time of awaiting in the wilderness of life on this earth. We're saved. We have our salvation. We've come out of the sin and bondage, but we await our, 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 the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's good for us to remember and to renew our commitment to be always and in all ways living all in for him. How is God calling you to respond to his word today, to the word of God? The word of God we can have many responses. We revere the word. Psalm 119, 16 says, I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. How is he calling you to respond to the word? The word may bring conviction that leads to salvation, yielding your heart to him, but it also will lead to sanctification, acknowledging where you're holding back or, or holding out. And, and I wonder, is there a part of your life where you're a holdout? Is there a corner of your heart where you've put essentially up a do not disturb sign? God, you can have this and this and this and this, but God, just let's just ignore that relationship or call you're asking me to heal. God, I just, just don't mess with my TV viewing habits. God, my finances are really off limits. What is that area that you just want to say, God, I'll give you everything else, but, but just don't make me go there. It, it, Psalm 119.59 says, I have considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes. Is he calling you to remember? It's good to go back and praise him for the journey, to see that you truly are a new creation. You're not what you used to be. You can look back and remember with grateful praise that you're not, you are no longer in Egypt. You're no longer in bondage to slavery and sin, no longer living that way. You don't have to take on the shame and guilt of all that. We can remember Egypt, but ladies, hear me. We don't have to go back and live in Egypt. We don't have to live in despair. We don't have to live and wallow in the shame and guilt of it because God has nailed that stuff to the cross. Let that go. In Exodus 14, 15, God gave Moses a message for the people in the wilderness. Tell the Israelites to move on. And some of us need to hear that. We're so wallowing in what's already been nailed to the cross. We need to be told, just confess it, mourn it, confess it, receive forgiveness, and then move on. Jesus paid the price for it. Maybe your response today is to renew, a call to abide in him. We need to keep on keeping on it. And it's his word that sustains us. His word is our daily bread. Like the Israelites in the wilderness, we need to gather fresh manna every single day from his word. Our walk becomes a continual conversation, knowing him, walking with him, renewing our commitment to live in him and through him and for him. And then Romans 12, 2 tells us, do not be conformed any longer to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We renew one morning and then the, the cares of the world pull us and shift us and we come back tomorrow morning and we plant our face in his book again and get renewed again. When we allow the spirit of God to take the word of God and saturate our hearts and minds, we become women of God committed to living lives daily, all in, living for the glory of the son of God. We, we learn to live. We want to live to delight in Jesus, to speak Jesus to talk about Jesus, to tell about Jesus, to share Jesus. As women of God, we revere, respond, remember, renew. And the basis of all of it is built on the person of Jesus Christ. He's the cornerstone on which we build our lives. Our mantra may not be, gentlemen, this is a football, but women of God, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Revere him, 
respond to him, remember him, and every single day renew your commitment to him. God had a word for the people while they were still in captivity from the prophet Jeremiah. He said in Jeremiah 31, 4, Again, I will build you and you shall be rebuilt. No one is so messed up that God can't put you back together. We are being rebuilt and changed day by day and moment by moment as God does his work in us. In Jeremiah 8, the walls have been rebuilt. Now it's time for the people to be rebuilt, for their relationship with God to be renewed. And how does God want to do the same for us? How does he want to rebuild and renew you? How is he calling you to return back to the basics, back to the word of God, to be filled with the spirit of God, to live in Christ, the son of God, and to do it all for the glory of God, to be wholehearted, all in, always and in all ways. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord God Almighty, we want to be there. We can get there, but we can't seem to stay there. But we thank you, God, that, you, that no matter where we wander or how we drift, you always call us back. You are so good and so faithful. God, I just pray that all of us would, would take a pair of minutes this week to remember, to think about who we were then, and, and, to, and to look back on that girl as almost a completely different person because she is to celebrate, Father, that, that you have chosen to call us to yourself and change us. And as we come and we see who we are now to celebrate that our lives have been changed and we're so grateful for the word of God and, the, and Jesus, the living word of God, who has changed us and sustains us and has more for us. God, we want to be women of God who are all in. I ask for conviction today, a word of conviction for each woman in this room, Show her Holy Spirit where she's holding out. What part is she clutching and holding on to that you're asking her to release so that she could live all in? And Father, thank you that your word does indeed lead us to repentance and to mourning as we bow down. But Father, let us not be women who stay there because the joy of the Lord is our strength. We want to rise up and worship for you to live always and always to make much of you. We revere you. We love you. We thank you. We praise you in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.